Amen. Well, good morning, Travis family. Uh, we are excited to worship uh, together today. If you are a guest with us, we would like to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, if you are here with us for the first time or, or for, the, for the manyth time, whatever it may be, we wish to tell you welcome and we're so excited that you're here. There is a card that's located in the seat in front of you. It's simply called our, our Next Steps card. It looks like this. Whatever your next step may be here in the life of Travis, we would like to extend that invitation to you. We would love to have your information. And uh, if you simply would just in insert this card, fill this out, insert this card into the offering plate or, or one of the boxes at any of your exits, uh, we would be so honored uh, for you to know and be known uh, here in the life of Travis Avenue. Uh, this morning, I have the honor of introducing to you two individuals that will make up our residency team for this up and coming year. Uh, church, I wanna introduce to you Kayla Green and Mia Alexander. Kayla is a returning resident with us here at Travis for this coming year, working with communications and assimilation. And Mia is our new resident this coming year, working with college students. Um, I can tell you that these two individuals are a vital part of our team as they seek to be a part of the advancement of God's kingdom and the mission here at Travis in the areas that we give to them to take part of and make much of Jesus in. I wanna encourage you to do one simple thing. When you see them, would you simply walk up to them and ask them this question, how can I be a part of your team? Are these teams, we need support through finances, we need prayer support. I wanna encourage you, they don't have to come find you, you go find them and you make it known to them that there you are excited to have them be a part of Travis Residency this coming year. We are so excited to have you guys on board this year. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm chapter 90. The psalmist says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Oh, 
Psalm 90, 14 reminds us that he does satisfy us with his unfailing love so that we may be glad all of our days. Let's stand and rejoice in him today. Praise to the Lord. Till I 
with me Father we just are so grateful for your incredible presence in this place Father we thank you that you are the great I am and Father we just ask that you would create in us a clean heart and an upright spirit that we might worship you Father we ask that our prayers our singing the preaching of your word and giving would bring you glory and joy, that we would be a sweet aroma to you. Father, there are so many needs. We come, there are some that come today with loneliness and fear. Would you be their encourager? Would you give them compassion? Will you be their friend that sticks closer than a brother? Father, there's so many that have medical needs and they're in pain. Would you be their great physician and their healer today? Father, there's so many that need you. We have a lost world that is desperate for answers and hope. So Father, may we be a light in a city. May we be a light on a hill. Father, that we would proclaim that you alone are worthy of all honor and praise. May they understand the gospel, what you did on the cross. Father, what you did in your resurrection power change us, Lord. Because we were here that we've experienced you. Make us a light in this dark. Father, we love you, we adore you. We lay our lives before you. Father, I ask that we would lift you up. You said if you be lifted up, you would draw all men to yourself. So that's the desire of our heart. Father, that we would lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We absolutely adore you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.
great and awesome is our God. Let's stand together as we continue to worship him this morning. Father, we are truly satisfied this morning because of your steadfast love toward your children. We have tasted and seen that you are good, and we take refuge in your mighty power. Lord, we ask that you would speak through Pastor Ben this morning and encourage us to stand firm in our faith and live a life that is pleasing in your sight. For we pray in the precious and holy and magnificent name of Jesus. Amen. You be seated. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. It was July of 1961, and Vince Lombardi sat there with a, a group of uh, men who played the game of football. And uh, this was a, an important uh, summer training camp. Uh, the previous year, they had made it to the championship game, but had lost by the score of 17 to 13 to the Eagles. And so standing before those gentlemen, he began with these words. Gentlemen, this is a football. (laughs) And from that, he started a training camp that would be focused on the fundamentals of football. How do we block? How do we run? How do we pass? Uh, to the point, one of his, his uh, players once said, hey, coach, could you slow down? You're going too fast for us, uh, to which he cracked a smile. But for him, he was convinced that what had been neglected in the previous year, that they had gotten so close, these pros, these who had played football for so long, they had neglected or lost sight of the fundamentals. And so he began at, at the beginning and then continuing on through his career, began his training camps with the with the fundamentals, and he would never lose in the playoffs again. Fundamentals are important. You may be sitting here and have been a Christian for a long time. You may have have walked through many things with the Lord, but I, I would invite us in this season and this time back to the fundamentals of the foundations of the faith. And 1 Peter is the fundamentals of the faith. Focusing on who we are in Christ and how do we then live that out in our lives. And today, we're going to talk about the foundation of the fundamentals of the Christian life. Today, Peter's going to show us, gentlemen, this is a football. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Christian life. And so, let's begin, and it it begins and ends with... God's grace to us. I want us to go to the end of 1 Peter, and then we're going to go back to the beginning. So 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to read verse 12. It says this, by Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you 
Notice what, how, why. Exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. This is the true grace of God, Peter says to, to the folks. What is? Well, everything in this book that we're going to cover, everything that we're going to walk through, this is the grace of God. It's a reminder that that's the motivation for Peter as he, he writes this letter uh, for Christians. Grace. Grace is both the undeserved favor of God, not in our own merits. We don't earn brownie points that earn us grace. It's his favor within us. And within that favor is a divine enablement to accomplish his will. Things I could not do on my own because of his grace now, I can walk with him. And Peter's declaration is to stand firm in it. In other words, to persevere. But also not just to persevere, but to thrive while facing, in this book, we're going to see suffering. The people that he's writing to are, are dealing with suffering specifically for the Christian faith. And so Peter's declaration is, hey, this is the true grace of God that we're going to talk about it, so you can stand firm in it. Not only uh, do you, can you persevere, but that you can thrive in, even in suffering. So Peter's call to the, to the Christian is this, first, don't retreat, don't don't give back ground that God has won in your life. But also don't veer to the left or the right. Don't allow discouragement or difficulty cause you to lose commitment to what Christ has called us to. Peter will say, I've written briefly to you. It's a short five chapter uh, letter. Uh, it will take you 15 to 20 minutes to read all at once. I've written briefly to you two, two things, exhorting and declaring. To exhort is to encourage someone, to, to call them to action, not just to say you're doing a good job, but hey, come on, don't, don't lose sight, keep up, let's go together. Uh, we need some exhortation in our life. Are, are, you, are you doing what you've been called to do? Are you walking in the fundamentals of the faith, even when difficulties come about. And then he says declaring, in other words, to bear witness to uh, Christians that this is true. What he's saying is true. Uh, you would say that when you were brought into a courtroom, you were a witness. Peter is an eyewitness to Jesus. And so Peter's declaring, hey, what I'm telling to you is true. He's exhorting and declaring this is the grace of God, his power in you, his favor in you to walk in it. And so he declares to stand firm in this grace. Stand firm in our identity with him and in our obedience and responsibility. The, the book of 1 Peter really can be uh, split into two main sections. One is our identity in Christ. Identity these days is a, a, a hot word. Everyone struggling or wrestling with what does identity mean? Peter's addressing it for us, helping us that in Christ, what is our identity? How, how do we live or who, who are we in, in that? And then walking in the second half of the book in how we live this out practically in our life. There are many themes within the book, but I just want to, there are three that we're going to see over and over again. The first one is this, when we walk in times of suffering or when we walk in the fundamentals of the faith in difficult times, Peter will call us over and over again in this book to hope. The promise of future salvation, that he will complete what he has begun in us. And Peter will say God uses suffering for our sanctification to help us grow as we look and await the future uh, final, finality of our salvation. Second thing we'll see over and over again is a call to holiness. Peter will call us in our personal lives to be holy as he is holy. But he'll also weed into some other areas of holiness, our, our social and our political lives. How appropriate in this election year, Peter would address, how do, we, how do we deal with those in authority over us? He doesn't stop there. A personal life, our social life, but also our communal life. How does the church respond to one another? A, a practical preservation of community even when suffering is taking place. What does that mean for our tongues? What does it mean for our love and hospitality to one another? For our service, the gifts that he's given us? What does it mean for the leadership of the body of Christ? 
What does it mean to walk in humility? All these things are the true grace of God that we can stand firm in, that Peter will call us to. With that in mind, now let's go to chapter 1, verse 1. The grace of God, the, the, uh, uh, the grace of God is what I would say the, uh, the atmosphere of the Christian. The, the way we live and thrive, just like water is to a fish, to those who are believers in Christ Jesus, we are ones who are surrounded by his grace, enabled by his grace to do what we've been called to do. And he begins the book like this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter begins by, by a, a recognition of first himself as the author. Peter is, uh, we don't have another Peter in the New Testament. This, this is Peter, and, and he further clarifies the apostle of Jesus Christ. He's the one who walked with Jesus. At the end of the book, he'll say, those from Babylon greet you. It's generally recognized that that's a, a, a word or referring to Rome, where a strong tradition was, Peter was and died in Rome. And so the, the thought is, this is at the end of Peter's life in the later years, probably in the, in the 60s, uh, before he would pass away, one of the, the later years where he is writing and encouraging uh, this group of people. Now, to the audience, he says, it's, it's to the elect, those who are exiles. Uh, to the elect, the, the chosen ones. A, a beautiful word later in chapter 2, he'll say, you are a, a chosen uh, and a royal priesthood. In other words, you've been called out by God into walking this Christian life. You didn't get here by accident, but he's, he's talking to Christians. This book is for those who are walking with Christ. The elect, the chosen ones. It, it refers back. We remember in the Old Testament, what does is, what is, uh, God do? He calls Abraham to be his people and his descendants, his chosen people. And now in the new covenant, he has chosen those who would by faith trust in him. And he has called them to himself. But then he goes on and uses another word to describe them. The, the elect, the, the ones who have been called out by God. And then the ones who are exiled. To, to be exiled is, uh, means someone who's living as a foreigner or in a strange place. And, and he, he lays out the regions where this letter is going. A, a circular letter, it's going to go to these different areas. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, this is most of the region of what we would know today as Turkey. It's intriguing that in Acts, when the Holy Spirit prevents Paul from going into some of these areas so he can go to Macedonia, these are some of the areas that he's prevented from going. And so you have a group of Christians, a group of elect, chosen people by God, walking and serving with Jesus in this area and region. Now, the, the question is, and, and people debate, have they been exiled? In other words, have they been taken from their areas and live there. There was a, a large group of Jewish people who, who were now living there, yes, but other Gentiles as well. And so the question is, are these in, in actuality exiles who've been through persecution, ripped from their homes and are fleeing? Uh, it may be, but I, I think more so, this is probably not a literal exile, but it's Christians and, and a recognition by Peter that when you become a follower of Christ, his chosen people, you now are living in a new realm, in the realm of his grace, and in the realm of the world, that doesn't fit well. We are exiles. We are not home. This is a temporary dwelling place. The question over and over again is, this suffering that Peter's going to address, what kind of suffering was it? Is he addressing a widespread event? This is right around when Nero would, would come and, and blame Christians for the fire but, uh, the, but, and, the, and the persecution would start, but it probably had not gotten out into those regions. And so the question is, is this a, a, spe a specific um, uh, mandated persecution or is this just in, in the reality a, a local conflict of, 
of increasing storms. And I, I think probably Peter's just addressing local conflicts and suffering that takes place from being an elect, from being a chosen one of God. And so within this this realm, you you see storm clouds on the horizon of Christianity, and and we know that from history. The next many years of Christianity after the 60s are going to bring great persecution that that have to do with laying down your life. It's not something Peter addresses here, so the thought is maybe these are just storm clouds uh, within society, a general dislike, a general growing of of an anti-Christian spirit. Uh, One uh, authority or one author said it this way, most lived on the underside of society, talking about Christians. They were under the authority of Rome. They were under unbelieving cruel masters or husbands. They suffered in everyday life and from imperial authority. You have someone who comes to trust Christ. And now socially they're not accepted because they don't go do the things that are socially acceptable. They don't go worship at the temples of the other gods. And when you, when you inject an exclusive God, an exclusive religion into uh, an a area that is very inclusive, uh, that's generally not favored well. Inclus- inclusivity works great until someone says, actually, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, not other gods, but Jesus is Lord. And all of a sudden then uh, you, you, don't, you don't have as much friendly inclusiveness uh, around you. And so these are folks who now socially begin to be ostracized. These are folks who begin to get passed up for raises or promotions or they lose their jobs. These are wives who come to an understanding and a belief of Jesus whose husbands now treat them very harshly because they won't go and worship at the temple of other gods or do other things. The reality of an exile, one who is not at home, one who is living in this world, in the difficulty of worshiping an exclusive God and declaring Jesus as Lord in a society that does not affirm that. We also are exiles. We are not home yet. And in a world and a society and a culture that says, whatever your truth is, to stand and declare Jesus is Lord, understandably places us at odds with the culture. That we would say there is one way to have a relationship with Christ. There is a narrow way of truth. Would you come and follow Jesus? Places us at odds with the society around us. And I might even go so far as to say this. I don't think it's a stretch to say there are gathering storm clouds in our horizons. What does it mean to walk in freedom? Praise God, we're able to meet and, and grow in this. But, but do we not see a, a more heated rhetoric against the exclusive claims of Christianity? First Peter is going to be a valuable help to us. How do we walk in times where in our workplaces we may be treated suffering for the cause of Christ? or in our, in our social uh, society. Paul, uh, Peter will say, uh, th- this is who I'm writing to. To encourage you, remember, and to exhort you, this is the grace of God. Now look at verse two. He's gonna continue on. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So the foundation, the football, the grace of God that Peter's talking about, Peter now goes on to talk about, look at what God's work in salvation has done for you. In other words, when you, when you lay the foundation of the Christian faith, it is not about what I have done, it is about what God has done on my behalf. And he lays that out in three uh, different uh, descriptions. First, he says, uh, you can rest assured, elect, exiles, y- you understand It is because God the Father took the initiative according to the foreknowledge of himself. You didn't come and happen chance upon salvation. It was God who pursued you. And that's of good news, God the Father. Your, Your salvation wasn't an accident. The omniscient wisdom and intention of God. This is his grace toward us. When times get difficult, we can first recognize that the foreknowledge of God 
the Father, the fact that he took the initiative in salvation toward us becomes an incredible encouragement on our behalf. I was thinking this week, a picture of that takes place, I think, in Luke 19. Remember, uh, Jesus is, is walking through the city and there are mobs of people there. And he stops and he looks up and he sees a, a man named Zacchaeus. And he stops and he says, Zacchaeus, if you remember the song, I'm going to your house tonight. And he comes to Zacchaeus' house and, and Zacchaeus has a, a, an incredible transformation of his life. And at the end of that section, you have this incredible, beautiful declaration in Luke 19, 10. It says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why did Jesus choose Zacchaeus? I don't know, but he did. Why did the Father choose me? I don't know, but by grace he did. What a foundation and a glorious step that is to recognize when suffering comes and difficulty comes, we can rest on the foreknowledge of God, that this wasn't an accident, that we didn't happen to fall into salvation. We were pursued. But he goes on. Another way that that God is at work in salvation in us, the foreknowledge of God the Father, and second, in the sanctification of the Spirit. The sanctifying work of the Spirit was at work within you. How does one come to know their need of salvation? If it's not the Spirit convicting, the Spirit awakening us into the reality of salvation. As the gospel is preached, the Spirit awakens us to our need of sanctification, to be sanctified before the Father. And he continues to do so today in this room. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, his spirit is working within the preaching of the gospel to convict us of sin, to make us more like Jesus Christ. That's what he does. And so Peter is saying, look, this is the grace of God to stand firm in it, to recognize God was at work in salvation and continues to be at work in salvation in our lives and hearts. He goes on to say, not only for, uh, because of the foreknowledge of God, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, but then for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. It's the Spirit that has enabled us. It's God's foreknowledge that has enabled us to obedience. How could I be obedient, even to respond in faith, unless his work is within me and his divine enablement has empowered me? to trust by faith what he has said to be true. When I came to Christ trusting in faith, it was first and foremost because of the work of God in my life. For sprinkling with his blood, that term, that view, uh, takes us back to the Old Testament, doesn't it? The sprinkling of of blood for, for atonement, for the forgiveness of sins. We've just celebrated Jesus dying on the cross, And being raised to life, why? His blood, a sacrifice for our sins, sprinkled on the the chair of my life, sprinkled on my life over my sins, so that I might be sanctified unto him. You have a beautiful picture here of God's work in salvation. Why does Peter start that way? Because in difficult times, when they come, and we begin to question, where, where is God in all this? The foundation the football is that God is at work in salvation. Paul will say it this way, that he who began a good work in you, he'll be faithful to complete it. And so the football is to recognize his work in our life, his work in our salvation as well. Today, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, if you've never understood the the obedience of what the the call is to to come, to surrender your life, to to lay down your own life for his and to place your faith in his atoning work, his work, his blood over the, the sin of your life, I would plead with you and beg with you today to any who would hear this, would you place your faith and trust in Christ? Come away understanding a new reality, a new reality of grace in your life and heart. In a moment, we're gonna offer an invitation. Even while we sing, I would ask you, I would invite you to come, to come in that act of obedience, to recognize 
Jesus' work is sufficient for your sin, for your separation from God. What news, what encouragement for us. So if I was to, to say this, here, here really is the football. Number one, your relationship with Christ is not by chance. We have here, notice, a Trinitarian declaration. It's God the Father at work, God the Spirit at work to enable us, and God the Son at work within the salvation to us. The Father knew and pursued, the Spirit awakened, and Christ's blood is sufficient, his sacrifice for us. Can I ask you for just a moment, for those of you who have been saved, would you remember, you remember the moment when you placed your faith and trust in Christ? Maybe, maybe you don't know the exact moment, but you recognize this death to life. Ephesians 2 talks about we were dead, now we're alive. When did you come to life? When did you come to swim in a new realm of grace in your life to recognize he is at work? It's his sacrifice that is enough. And I would just think about those in this. How, how did the father pursue you? What were the circumstances in, around that now you look back and go, wow, God was using that for, to get my attention to awaken me? How, how did the, the spirit awaken your life and heart? I remember vividly in the preaching of the word, sitting as a young man, recognizing my need for salvation. The spirit had awakened me to my need and I needed at the end of the service, I ran to my dad, I grabbed his hand and I said, I need to place my faith and trust in Christ. That didn't happen by chance. God was at work before I even came to that understanding and placed my faith and trust in him. And then when you fully understood Christ's sacrifice on your behalf, the, the, the mind bomb that, that went off to recognize the gift that has been offered to us in salvation. Do you remember that? Could it be possible that over many years, if some of you have walked with Christ, maybe some of that memory has faded a little bit. Maybe we've gotten a little bit past the football into other things to recognize his work within us. Your relationship with Christ is not by chance, so you can stand firm knowing that you won't be abandoned in suffering. That's what Peter is getting at. If you didn't fall into salvation, then you can rest assured you're not gonna fall out of salvation or as we've sung, he will hold me fast. In the difficulties of, of, of life, in the difficulties of suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ, he, he will hold me fast. So the picture of salvation that, that Peter draws on this foundation is not so much me sitting on a harbor with all these boats to choose from, which, which boat, which God will I worship? But the picture that he's drawing us at the beginning is of me drowning in the sea and God the Father pursuing and God the Spirit pursuing and God the Son pursuing me for my salvation, coming out to sea in my drowning and grabbing hold of me, holding me fast and me in the boat now recognizing his work on my behalf. What grace of God that he gives us. What response do we have in return except to worship him? I'm his. I'm his. And then Peter gives a, a greeting, a, a Christian greeting, one we see often a greeting, I would say, of the fundamentals. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. At the end of the book, we have this is the grace that he's talked about at the beginning of the book. He's wishing them, he's giving them. He says, may the grace, a blessing in your life, as we pursue this reading together, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. As a congregation, Travis, can I say that's my prayer for us as we walk through First Peter. That as we recognize who we are in Christ, his foundation for us, and as we recognize what he has called us to do, that we would, our, our, the grace and peace that we walk in with him and with each other would be multiplied in incredible ways. The football of the Christian life in the reality is this, it's not about you. It's about him and his grace. 
My dad used to sit me down every once in a while and he would say these words to me. He'd say, Ben, I want you to know if I lined up all the boys in the whole world and could choose one to be my son, I choose you. I choose you. In the moments as a, a child, what that encouraged me in, that even though in my life circumstances changing, I knew my father loved me deeply. I knew my father had gone to great lengths and would, would continue to go to great lengths to walk in that. Now as a father, I get the privilege to sit my kids down and to say the same thing. The foundation and the fundamentals of the Christian faith is this. Praise God. He's chosen us. Now we walk in his grace. A grace that he's extended to us for the furthering of his kingdom for the gospel. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, the letter of 1 Peter that would give us hope that you will finish what you have started. And Lord, the foundation of our life, the, the water that we swim in, the grace of God, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you that as a young man, I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and that has made all the difference in the world. And so Lord, as we go back to the fundamentals, as we walk through this encouragement, I pray that grace and peace would be multiplied to us as a congregation and that in obedience we would see and understand the greatness of our God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand? Let's respond to the Lord.
thank you, Pastor Ben, for that sermon. I was wondering how you're going to get so much out of two verses, but you did it, brother. And we give our all to the Lord. He helps us to stand firm and be obedient to him. So my prayer is that we would be obedient in all that he asks us to do this week. This week, we have an amazing opportunity to have another time of worship in the middle of the week on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. We have the awesome privilege of hosting the singing men of Texas here in this room at 7 p.m., if I didn't say that already. And so if you could come and bring your friends, we've got a lot of seats to fill, and the men are going to give you an amazing time of worship Thursday at 7 p.m. If you could be here, that would be just incredible. You'll be blessed for that. And he will help you to stand firm uh, because of that opportunity to be here and worship with him. Let's sing the doxology as we prepare to depart. (laughs) 